All right, good afternoon. Thank you everyone for attending today's webinar, Pneumatics, Choose the Best Valve for Optimum Performance, brought to you by Humphrey Products and Design World Magazine. My name is Paul Heaney, and I'm the Editorial Director for Design World, as well as the Site Editor for Mobile Hydraulic Tips and Pneumatic Tips, which are a couple of great online resources that I hope you all are familiar with. A little bit of background on me. I have a mechanical engineering degree from Georgia Tech and have been covering the fluid power industry and design, engineering, manufacturing for almost 15 years now. I'm pleased to be your moderator today. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our presenter for being here and to give you all a little bit of a background on him. Nelson Tanzi is account manager for Humphrey Products. Nelson uh, has more than 30 years of fluid power experience designing and specifying valves and other components. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Ohio Northern University, and he is a licensed professional engineer with an additional five years of direct experience in manufacturing engineering. Now, just a couple of housekeeping details before we get started. If you wish to tweet about this webinar anytime during or after, you can use the hashtag DWWebinar, which is all one word, and we will have a Q&A session after the presentation. So please go ahead and submit your questions you know, right as you think of them, and we will ask as many of them as we can after the presenter is finished. Uh, questions can be asked using the GoToWebinar dialog box, which is uh, on the right side of your screen. And now on to our uh, presentation. Without further ado, I'm going to hand the mic over to Nelson. Nelson, take it away. You can see the screen now. Good afternoon. Um, anyway, the topic for today, as Paul said, is uh, choose the best valve for optimum performance. Um, when you're uh, looking at different valves, you want to consider the application, the correct functions of that valve, to choose the pr proper valve to use in any kind of an application. Um, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about uh, balanced and unbalanced type of valve. Uh, what we mean by that is internally in a valve, if you have a valve that is balanced, the internal pressures will be equal throughout the valve. And what that allows you to do is um, have optimum shift pressures and shift times with between the spring and whatever uh, returns or fires the valve as it goes on. Um, in an unbalanced valve, typically, typically like a coil plunger type of a valve, you'll have areas that are not balanced um, these can uh, be valves like, like this coil plunger, but it can also uh, have an advantage in that the air pressure will help close or seal the valve in some applications. So the air pressure is a primary force used in a lot of cases to return, uh, return the valve to its closed position should the spring uh, fail. Um, they're simple construction, usually small in size, and do have some low leakage to low cost um, quality. There are three, we're gonna talk about three basic valve designs uh, and characteristics and benefits and typical applications to these different types of valves. The first one is a poppet design valve. In a poppet design valve, what you have is a rubber or resilient type seal that is pushed into a seat um, or we call it a poppet. I like to say it's like pulling the cork out of the bottle. Uh, you move that uh, stopper out just a little bit and you get a very large flow path. It's compatible with a lot of different types of medias or compressed airs. Um, there, in this type of a valve, there are very few dynamic or moving or sliding type uh, seals in it. So you need less or no lubrication. Um, it is typically tolerant or a little more tolerant than a spool and sleeve type valve to some uh, contaminant or whatever you have in, in the air that you're using or the media that you're using. It's typically a fairly fl high flow type of a valve, uh, short stroke, and which means that you have a very quick response time. So these valves uh, will handle a little bit different uh, uh, medias and will be very quick to respond because of the short stroke. Another somewhat variation to that poppet is the diaphragm poppet design. It's kind of an expansion on the poppet in that we have um, we have the poppet here, but we also have a diaphragm 
this will help hold the poppet in the proper positions because of the webbing. Uh, it's a very reliable type of valve. It uh, doesn't really require lubricant because there's no sliding seals in this type of a valve, uh, uh, capable of a lot of different types of media. Um, you know, it really depends, in this case, it really depends on what the media is and what the uh, seal material or the diaphragm material is to determine what you can run through this type of a valve. It's a very durable valve and typically very low leakage because you have really what it comes down to is a rubber membrane and it will oftentimes you'll have uh, isolation between the media and the, the actuator, which, whether it's an air piloted version or electrical version or, or whatever. Now the spool type of valve, um, there's several types of this. It's a very popular type of valve. Um, we have, uh, it's basically the spool will move back and forth. You'll have an O-ring design version. It's uh, very small, high functional, with uh, less expensive in some cases. Uh, disadvantage is the O-ring mechanical seal is, create, it, is needed for the seal. Um, you know, a significant amount of the O-ring surface and, and uh, you have a sliding or a dragging along which is going to create friction. Uh, these are generally uh, need some type of lubricant in them, whether it's a pre-lube or a, a dynamic type of a lube. Um, on and on that same type of uh, valve, you have um, a baked on seal where, and we don't show a picture of that, but it's where a seal would be baked onto the spool itself. Um, it's a relatively inexpensive. Uh, valve, it'll have maybe a little bit less friction because of the way they, they develop it. Um, but again, it, the disadvantage is the rubber bonded. That bond has to be good and you're going to have um, some type of a drag in this area here as this, as this valve slides or, or the spool moves. A lap spool and uh, sleeve type of a valve, um, it is where you have just a typically a stainless steel uh, spool and, and sleeve, small in size, high functionality. Uh, the spool actually rides on a, a cushion of air. Um, it does require, because of that cushion air, it has somewhat of a continuous leak to it. Um, and you have to be concerned about um, if you're going to use this valve for holding a cylinder in position, for example, um, it may not be the best type of valve to use because of that leakage that is just part of the design. So if you're going to use a valve like that in a, a situation where you want to hold a cylinder in position, maybe where it's already got weight on it, um, in a three position type of an application or whatever, then you may have to have some type of a PO check um, for that. Um, again, the poppet design advantage is low friction. Uh, reliable, uh, no sticking because the stem and seal don't really slide. So uh, um, there we go with that. Air versus solenoid valve. And, and today we're not really going to talk about the mechanical or mechanical type operations of a, of a valve. That is another option, but today we're going to talk about those that are operated by air and those that are operated by a solenoid type of a signal. Now what do you consider when you're going to look at what which one of these two you're going to use. Um, air is intrinsically safe. So if you have an explosion a atmosphere, whether it's a gas or a dust, or possibly uh, some type of explosion like ammunition that you're, you're uh, in that type of an area, then an air type signal might be a best way to go because a solenoid control valve obviously has electricity in it and you have the potential for uh, some type of a spark. When you're also considering the two of them, temperature ranges that you're going to be involved in, whether it's going to be a continuous duty or continuously held into a position, um, as you know that a coil will produce heat. Now some of those things can be compensated for in how they de design the spool, but it is a consideration uh, when you're deciding whether you're going to go an air or a solenoid. And of course a lot of people go solenoid today because of uh, the programmable controllers. Electrical controls, obviously, you're going to need some type of a solenoid to, uh, to activate the valve. 
Air pilot valves, um, you, you are really moving the valve with a signal of air. It shifts the valve and then typically um, an internal air or spring is used to return the valve to its original um, position. Um, so you have to determine what's, how that's going to work. Um, but you also have to think about, and we talk about failure later, what happens if you're using an internal air signal to return that uh, valve to its original position? Um, if you lose all air to a machine, what does the valve do? So that's a consideration when you're looking at this as, as well, and whether you use a air pilot return or a spring type return. You can also have a double air piloted type valves, uh, two position, double pilot. Um, it's used typically like with a momentary air signal going to the, move the spool to its uh, position. And then a lot of times you'll have a mechanical type of a detent, or it could be again an air pilot uh, detent as well um, to hold that in position. Another uh, um, valve that is out there is the indirect acting valve. And what this is is a typically a solenoid control air piloted valve. In these type of a valve, you have a small uh, three-way type valve in the solenoid area that will use air pressure to move the spool over in position. Um, these came about a lot as the programmable controllers came along. Um, 30 years ago, we used a lot of 110 volt for controlling valves, big clunky solenoids, big valves, and it wasn't an issue. But as you started using programmable controllers to control machines, power consumption became much more important, um, and the controllers weren't able to handle some of these higher current loads or wattage requirements. So they started making valves with that are indirect acting or the solenoid control air piloted valves where a small valve will move a larger valve. And with that, you have um, uh, the smaller valve, you, you have less current needed for it. Now, there is a downside to that that you have to remember, and that in that type of a valve, you have a minimum pressure internally that you need to supply to move the spool. And in many cases, that's an internal porting into a valve, or in some cases, to get around that, you'll have a second um, pressure or a piloted pressure that you'll bring into the valve somewhere around that solenoid to use for shifting the solenoid itself. Um, indirect acting, um, higher flow, low power consumption, greater shift forces, and a lot of variety. It's a very popular valve to use um, today. A direct acting valve um, utilizes the force of the magnetic field in the, in the solenoid to move the valve or spool or pop it or whatever you have. So when the, uh, typically in these direct acting, you'll have um, the solenoid moving directly to the spool to move it over. Uh, you'll have either a double solenoid where you're pushing from both sides when you need to return it, or in many cases, a a single solenoid will have a mechanical spring that returns the valve back to its position. Uh, direct solenoid or direct acting solenoid valves advantages, there's no minimum pressure to this. So we don't have that piloted air that we have to be concerned with. A valve like this oftentimes can run from full vacuum to whatever the rated pressure is. If you need to run something in the neighborhood of uh, five or 10 PSI, you can do that as well. Um, oftentimes, because of the way that they design these, often with a pop it, it'll be extremely low leakages. It's a very simple construction. You don't have a second valve uh, somewhere located on the valve itself. Um, it'll be multi-purpose, and what I mean by that is that typically with a direct acting valve, we're not concerned about what port we're pressurizing. Uh, in a three-way function, you might pressurize what would be normally the exhaust valve or the exhaust port and bring pressure in that way. In a three-way valve that's direct acting, you can use it as a selector, as a diverter, uh, because we don't need those internal air pressures to move the spool around or the poppet around. 
Um, and it's very oftentimes, again, it's going to be great flow. If you size these correctly, like we talked about earlier, as being balanced, you still will have a low power consumption. And because we're going directly from the solenoid to the uh, spool or the poppet, you don't have uh, double movements in there, and they're going to be very fast response times. Another thing that you want to be considering when you're looking at uh, valve selection is what's the quality of air? How clean is the air that you're going to be using, and what's the potential for contaminants in there? You have to consider moisture. Uh, we're up here in Michigan, and of course this time of the year can be very humid. Um, we can have dust, you can have particulate in there, so you're going to have to think about that if you have a, a lap spool type valve. Um, those have very close tolerances between the, the spool and the uh, sleeve, and you have to watch what kind of contaminants you put in there. If you run that type of a valve um, with lubricant and then allow that to dry out, it can stick. So considerations to think about when you're using uh, uh, valves and what kind of quality that you have for the air. Another thing everybody thinks about is speed. Uh, what's required of the flow of the valve for one thing? How much air do you need to get through it? So you're going to have to somehow determine that number and then determine what size valve you need to go from there. You also have to think about response time needed for the valve, both a minimum and a maximum response time, because that's all part of uh, your total cycle time. And then another thing that you're going to have to think about is the distance from your valve to whatever type of work you're doing, whether it's a cylinder or some other type of actuator or whatever, you have to consider uh, how far away it is and remember to have that as part of your, your uh, calculations on, on uh, speed and flow. So when a sizing to, to size a valve correctly, you know, a lot of people will just look at, well, whatever my actuator is, it's a quarter inch port, I'm going to use a quarter inch valve, or a three inch port, I'm going to use a three inch valve. Um, it can work that way, but we find a lot of times that the ports on an actuator are larger than what you really need for the flow to go through uh, to make the thing work in the cycle time that you're, you're looking for. So that's not always the best or optimum way to determine what size of valve you use. Uh, using C sub V is a very quick approximate, approximation for uh, um, what you're trying to size for a valve, and it's a very great comparison between one valve and another. The problem with that is it's not as 100% accurate as most all of these things are, um, because you have to uh, know what your your pressures are, both in and back pressure, and temperatures, and other everything else like that. Few people really understand what the calculation is or a C sub B, and fewer yet will even go through this calculation. But we're showing you this slide right here because that is actually what you would need to determine if you were to develop a, a C sub B factor for a valve or a system to determine what the flow would be. Pretty complex, um, not really something that most people are going to get into the middle of. So one of the best ways, I think, for determining uh, what size of a, a valve that you need is really is this chart right here. If you look at this right here, what it amounts to is you've got a T1, T2, T3, and T4. When you have a valve, you have the T1 is from energizing the valve to you get to about 10% of the required pressure to go. And then T2 is the time at which you get to that flow that you need and fill a chamber. A lot of different uh, manufacturers will give you uh, what the fill times are for a different size of chamber, and then you can work from that to determine what your flow time is. Then on the back side of it, you're going to have a de-energizing time, and I'm assuming kind of here that we're working with an electric solenoid, but it could also be a piloted version. How long does that take to happen before you get some type of movement in the valve? And then, of course, to decay the pressure down to some type of level. Um, and this is, uh, this is kind of going through it. I'm not going to go through a lot of the next couple of pages of calculations. Um, but if you had the, the volumes of the cylinder and the volumes on 
on the line and you knew the fill and exhaust time um, of, of for your valve, what it's capable of doing, you could go through calculations and figure it out from there. Probably the simplest way to do it, you're going to get pretty close with it, is figure the volume of the actuator and you should also be figuring out if you're a long ways from the actuator, what's the volume in the line. Determine the cycle time required and, and calculate from there some CFM rating. Now this should be a CFM rating at some pressure and typically valves have a CFM rating at a pressure, say 100 PSI. You may or may not be working at that at that pressure. That's why the C sub B calculations come into effect. But you know, if you look at a two inch, four, six inch stroke cylinder, you're looking at a 18, almost 19 cubic inches, very small when you're talking about cubic feet. Now, if you look at a cylinder like that, it's probably got at least a quarter inch ports on it. And a one second flow time, you're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of about 0.56 uh, CFM. And most valves that are a quarter inch ported valves are probably going to have substantially higher valves and or higher flows than that. So really what you're probably going to end up with is some type of an eighth inch ported valve in that neighborhood it would probably work as far as the flow rate that you'd need to make this uh, cycle or this application work. One last thing we want to kind of cover is valve failure considerations. Um, you know, when you're working on a system, whether it be a machine or whatever, what you need to figure out is what happens in failure. What is your failure mode? Um, is it that um, uh, you don't want the machine to move at all? What happens when you lose electrical signal? What happens when you lose supply signal? Um, many customers will require that all stored energy be dumped in some way, whether whether it's an electrical signal or an air pressure uh, that's stored somewhere. And that could be even inside of a cylinder that's being held uh, in position. So you have to consider those things when you're uh, determining what kind of valve to use. You're going to have to think about forces to return. Are you going to return with a spring, a mechanical spring, or an air spring? or you're going to have a detent to hold it in position. Now the problem with an air spring, if you have to dump all air pressure from a system, is that you no longer have that stored energy. Um, in what position will the valve fail? Is it going to be normally open or normally closed? And then the last thing that we don't have on here is what happens when you bring that machine back up, when you start reintroducing the different uh, energies, whether it be an electrical signal or air signal. And in what order are you going to make that happen? Are you going to turn on the air first, like with a slow start valve on an FRL system? Um, or if you're using an externally piloted valve, maybe you bring that control pressure up first before you start bringing in what I would call the power side of it. And when you're thinking about all of these things, you first want to, of course, uh, consider on all of these different factors that you protect first and foremost life and limb. You don't want anybody getting hurt on a machine because either the way it went down, what happens when it's sitting there, and what happens when you bring that uh, piece of equipment back up into operation. After that, of course, you want to be able to be sure that you're protecting your machining and your tooling. Um, what happens with that when, it, when, the, when the system fails or shuts down, and what happens when you bring it back up? And then, of course, uh, protecting of a process. If you can figure out how to do that and take all these considerations into determining what type of valve you're going to use uh, and how it's going to potentially fail, what happens then, and what you do when you uh, reintroduce some of the energies into the system. So that's a really short uh, description of what some of the things that you'll want to consider when you're looking at uh, selecting an air valve, the type of air valve, whether it's a pop it or a spool design, um, and, and whether you want to have an air signal or a solenoid signal, a direct or an indirect, and of course your sizing for flow rate, uh, and then what are your fail modes or fail conditions um, when you're all said and done with that part of it. Um, that's what we have today. 
Um, I'm told that the slides will be shared after the webinar. Um, oh, the question was, what is detent force? Basically, there's a couple different ways to detent a valve. A lot of times, it'll be a groove in the spool and uh, little ball bearings that are held in place by a spring will fit into those grooves and hold, mechanically hold the valve in position. If you have a mechanically detented valve uh, with that little ball bearing or what are holding into the, uh, the groove in the spool, then it's mechanically detented and won't move. So you don't have to worry about whether you use and lose an electrical signal um, or if you uh, um, lose the air signal on there. Hey, this is, this is great information, Nelson. Thank you very much for a, a wonderful presentation. Um, everyone, we're going to use the remaining time here for uh, the Q&A period. Um, I see that some of you are already uh, typing your questions out, which is great. It's not too late uh, to send in your questions. Again, just use that dialog box on your GoToWebinar screen. You can type in the uh, uh, whatever question you have, and we will get to as many of them as we can. Um, all right, Nelson, I've got a, a couple questions here. Can you clarify your, uh, your explanation of flow rate calculation versus CV calculation? Well, really, the flow rate calculation is is a is a simple, quick way to determine a flow, and it would typically be done at a pressure uh, because valves will give you a flow rate, say at 100 psi, what CFM it'll move at 100 psi. When you you calculate, and we showed that big long um, calculation for the C sub V, that takes into effect uh, back pressures. It takes into effect um, um, temperatures and all sorts of different types of information like that. It's, it's, it's typically really done that people will calculate all that information. In a lot of cases, they don't even know what that information is. So mm -hmm. that's why I, I talk about having a, just a flow rate calculation that gets you in the ballpark, and it's, it's probably going to be pretty close to what you need. That okay. Sense? What, what filtration level do you recommend for valves? Good question. Um, you know, 30 years ago, a, a 40 micron filter was fine. Of course, you want to take the uh, uh, the moistures out of the air here in Michigan. Again, a lot of people will have some type of a chiller or after cooler to, to drop the air temperature down from the uh, uh, from the compressor so that they can take some of the moisture out so it doesn't end up clogging up in your valves or components. I'm seeing a lot more uh, specs requesting um, a five micron filter uh, to get that air just a little bit cleaner than it was before. So it's been uh, over history, the last 30 years or so, about a 40 micron filter, and more recently I'm seeing um, specs for that five micron filter. And it can go coalescing filters. That's a whole other topic, getting into filtration, but uh, either a five or 40 is kind of where we would, and it depends on the type of valve. Again, a pop okay. type valve, you can get away with a 40 micron. All right, one of our viewers uh, said that they, they have a servo application, and the servo comes down when the servo is left unused over a period of time. What kind of valve can we use? And then they mentioned that it also happens to the air cylinders in that application. Any thoughts there, Nelson? Um, you can get what's called a pilot operated check or a PO check valve. And what it does is it locks the air. Um, say if you've got the cylinder rod hanging down, you would you would have that PO check on the rod end, and it would lock the air into the cylinder. There are other considerations to be sure. Uh, for example, make sure you've got the seals on the piston of the cylinder that they're good and don't leak. It's a lot of problems sometimes when you're trying to lock in position, but a uh, PO check, I would not use a lap spool and valve uh, with that if I didn't have a PO check. Um, a poppet type valve is much better when you're looking at holding air in, into an actuator because it's a resilient seal, it's that cork going into the bottle. So I would use one of those uh, type of products in there, either a PO check or a, a poppet type of a valve. Another question, what, in general, what type of valve is faster? Uh, also a good question. We, 
we think that the direct acting is because you don't have that second valve or second solenoid. You're going directly from the solenoid to the uh, to the spool, so you don't have a redundancy in uh, in systems. So your your little poppet valve. The other thing with a poppet valve, direct acting poppet valve, that is, you have very very short strokes. So if you have a direct acting poppet valve, it's going to be a very very quick valve, uh, short stroke directly, the solenoid connected directly to the poppet. Uh, I think that's probably where you're going to find the best speeds. Okay. Uh, one of our viewers wants to know, is there any pneumatic simulation software uh, for optimizing response time and exhaust time? I know that various manufacturers um, do have some of those kind of pieces of, of equipment. Um, there is an engineering program out there called CFD. You might Google that and find it, and I think that might help them out. Okay. Um, what handy reference manuals are available for pneumatics and valves? What handy reference manuals? There, there, um, there are several different people that, that make manuals. Uh, I know FPDA had a small uh, kind of a notebook that I don't know if I'm supposed to say names or not. I think it was printed. I don't work for them, so I can say Walmack. They have mm -hmm. some manuals out there that are pretty good. Is that, the, um, is that the lightning reference book? Yes, I believe it is, yes. I think it, so, yeah. It's probably about 50 or 60 pages. They also make a whole bunch of manuals as well. And the other, uh, good, another good source is the uh, Fluid Power Society has a lot of educational materials. Um, mm -hmm. If you plug into them, they've got a lot of information out there for those kind of things. All right. Uh, someone wants you to says, will you please discuss a little bit on the fast-acting ALD valves? Fast-acting ALD valves. What do we mean by an ALD valve? I am not sure. Um, because all they wrote. All right. Let's go into another one. Maybe they'll maybe they'll uh, write a little more in. Uh, someone said it's kind of a specific question, but maybe it'll fit some other people's. Uh, applications. They need a 2,500 PSI check valve. What type would you recommend? About 4 liters per second and 20 cycles per second. 20 cycles per second at 2,500 PSI. <laughs> There's a smoker for you. Um, <laughs> um, you know, that's you're getting into the, into the hydraulic area. How much uh, leakage are you going to be able to have on something like that? Um, uh, I'd probably we I haven't dealt too much with hydraulic and high pressure of that neighborhood, so I'm not quite sure what to tell them to do with that. Um, I'd probably start looking in some of the hydraulic lines. So at that pressure, you know, you get air too uh, too high a pressure, and you're you get some volatility there because you're compressing, and if it ever breaks, then that air will instantly expand. To whatever atmospheric pressure is. So okay. I would start looking at hydraulic stuff for that one. All right. Um, is there any ballpark equivalent between CV and volume flow, such as CFM? Um, there is, and you got to be a little careful with that again because we're looking at different pressures and uh, what are we looking at? Typically, you're looking at, you know, compression factors with the C sub V. But about in the neighborhood of about 32 CFM at 100 PSI is one CFM. Another ballpark, if you're looking at liters a minute, uh, is somewhere around 1,000 liters a minute is one CFM. So you can you can approximate using those numbers, um, which is kind of helpful, especially with the liters per minute, because a lot of valves um, are specified as liters per minute, and you can convert mm -hmm. over to C of V that way. Okay, let's let's go back to the fast acting ALD valves, and, and I've gotten some clarification. The ALD is atomic layer deposition for high K dielectric materials uh, for memory and logic manufacturing. Well, you got me on that one. I don't know that one. Um, I've not I've not dealt with with atomic layered um, deposition. deposition. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to punt on that one. I don't know. All right. Well, uh, hope maybe we can find something out and, uh, and and get back to that that one user. Okay. All right. Well, uh, that that uh, pretty much clears up our questions, Nelson. I think you uh, you did a great job with your presentation, and uh, you didn't leave a lot of uh, things unspoken. You, I think you covered everything. So, I, I just wanted to uh, remind everyone that uh, if you have any additional questions after the webinar, you're welcome to email those to me at theeny at wtwhmedia.com and uh, our, our the friendly folks at Humphrey Products will uh, certainly follow up and answer any questions that you know come to you uh, an hour or a week from now. Um, also we will be emailing this presentation to everyone in the coming days and in a few days it will also be available at www.designworldonline.com. Thank you to everyone for attending this webinar from Design World and Humphrey Products. Have a great rest of your day. Goodbye.